Welcome, I'm Pastor Amy, lead pastor at Hopewell. And today we're finishing our summer sermon series on 10 questions Jesus asked. Today we're looking at Luke 11, verses 1 to 13, which say this. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything out of friendship, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asked for a fish, would give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asked for an egg, would give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, we seek your blessing and your guidance as we explore this teaching from Jesus. Tell us what you want us to know. Show us who you are, that we may love you even more. Amen. Why pray, church? What's the point, the purpose? Do we pray because we need help? Because we want God to step in and fix something? Because things feel out of control? If so, that will affect the way we pray. Do we pray because we're stressed and we need peace? Because we're looking for calm in the storm? If so, that will affect the way we pray. Do we pray because it seems like the right thing to do? Because all our other church friends do it? Or because someone else expects us to? If so, that will affect the way we pray. Why pray? Have you ever wondered that? If I polled 10 of us right now, we might get 10 different answers. But here's the thing. If we don't know why we pray, we won't know how to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. Like the disciples, we need more than the how. We need the why. Sometimes from our very human perspective, prayer can feel like a way to get God's attention and enlist God's power on our behalf. It can be easy to think about prayer as a tool for getting what we need or for controlling outcomes. After all, across many religious cultures and throughout history, prayer has been seen as a way to gain favor from the divine. Sometimes we turn to prayer when we need something from God, thinking if we just say the right words, it will get God to respond. But this misses the point entirely because from a divine perspective, prayer is not about performing or pleasing or finding the right words. It's about relationship. In today's scripture, the disciples ask Jesus to teach them to pray the way he does. But Jesus doesn't give them a formula to coax or direct or instruct God. He offers a prayer that is centered on relationship, starting with the words, Our Father. That's the foundation, the starting point for everything. 
Before we bring our worries, our needs, or even our thanks, we first recognize who God is and who we are to God. It's a reminder that prayer isn't just about what we want or need. It's about nurturing our relationships with God and learning to trust God's love and care for us. After teaching them the Lord's Prayer, Jesus tells a story about a man who goes to his friend's house at midnight to ask for some bread. He's in a tough spot because some unexpected guests showed up at his house and he has nothing to give them. At first, his friend doesn't want to get up and help. But eventually he does, not because they're friends, but because the man just won't give up asking. This story shows one of the toughest parts of prayer, persistent waiting. Sometimes it feels like we're knocking on a door that won't open. We pray and we look for answers, but the waiting, it is so tough, isn't it? Why do we have to keep asking, seeking, and knocking? Why doesn't God answer right away? Give what we need. Do what we ask. I don't know. But here's what I've come to realize, and it's not always easy to accept. Prayer is less about getting what we ask for and more about deepening our relationship with God. It's an ongoing conversation where we not only speak, but also listen for God's guidance. And in that exchange, we become more aware of God's presence. And through that presence, we are changed, strengthened, and shaped. Now, that doesn't mean we'll embrace every challenge that comes our way. We won't. But with God's help, even in the hardest moments, we can grow and learn from them. I remember the first time someone told me that. It made sense to me, but I didn't like it at all. I was 18 years old, and my cousin Michael had just died by suicide. I was devastated. I was devastated. And I couldn't even think about learning anything, much less trusting God's goodness along the way. Because in moments like that, it's hard not to confuse what happened with God's character. Have you been there? In that place of wondering, how? How could a good God allow such pain? Is God even good or loving? And suddenly I had questions I had never had before. And for a long time, I found myself in a season of asking, seeking, and knocking without any easy or satisfying answers. But even in that wilderness, I kept praying, even when I didn't feel like it, because I didn't even know what else to do. Some days my prayers had no words, just tears. Maybe you've been there too. Looking back now, years later, I know that God was doing a deep work in my soul. The answers didn't come quickly, and they didn't come in a way I expected. But God was present in the struggle, and through that time of waiting and persistence, God helped me to untangle the pain of Michael's decision from the goodness of God's character. I see Jesus doing some untangling here in this scripture, especially in the last part, where he asks the final questions of our summer sermon series. He asks, if a son asks for a fish, who will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Or if he asks for bread, will give him a stone? Those are some strange questions, aren't they? In hearing them, we may wonder who would be so clueless or so heartless to give a child those things instead of what the child is actually asking for. So understanding them in their cultural context helps. It always helps. When this was written, bread, it was round and thin. And after cooking it on both sides, they'd place it on a stone of the same size and then stack the bread one on top of the other and then put a stone on top to keep it safe. Over time, the butter from the bread might make the stones look like bread. But Jesus points out that no father would be so careless as to confuse a stone for bread. Next up, the fish and the snake. Back then, there were water serpents that resembled fish. 
So someone who didn't know much about them could easily mix them up. But a caring father wouldn't let that happen. If his son asked for a fish, a good father would make sure he gave him exactly that and not a snake by mistake. Finally, the egg and the scorpion. A white scorpion has a body shape that could be confused with an egg, especially when the scorpion rolls itself into a ball. So a young child might not know the difference. But what father wouldn't know better? What father, when his son asks for an egg, would ever mistakenly or even intentionally give him a scorpion instead? Who could do that? Certainly not God our Father, Jesus says. The imagery here is powerful because by using it, Jesus is making a profound statement that at the heart of God, there are fish, not snakes, bread, not stones, eggs, not scorpions. In other words, God is good. And so God does not intentionally or accidentally harm us. As I said, it took me a long time to understand that what happened to Michael was not God's fault or doing, not some sort of divine punishment or oversight, not a scorpion or a stone or a snake. And when I think back over Michael's life with the idea of God's goodness in my mind, I remember the many eggs God offered him. They often came in the form of people, helpers, treatment, moments of clear and loving intervention that for reasons still unknown to me, he was not able to embrace. But now secure in God's everlasting arms, I do believe Michael has come face to face with God and with the truth that Jesus offers here in Luke 11, that God is good. And at the heart of God, there are eggs not scorpions. I was 18 years old when God started this conversation with me, and we are still having it. And it's a tender one. It's really tender because it's not always easy to determine what's an egg and what's a scorpion. That takes a lot of practice and discernment. Haven't we prayed at different points in our lives to receive things that we perceived to be eggs? relationships or things or circumstances that we thought would be good for us, but they weren't actually? And haven't we prayed asking God not to give us things we perceived to be scorpions, things we thought could never be good, but they actually were? And haven't we wondered whether an obvious scorpion like tragedy or adversity or grief was God's fault or doing? This is a tender conversation, and it challenges my assumptions, our assumptions about who God is and how God is present and active during those more challenging times. I don't think we will ever have all the answers to our questions, but I am so grateful that Jesus gives a clear answer to the question, is God good? Unequivocally, yes, he says. What father, when his son asks for an egg, would ever mistakenly or even intentionally give him a scorpion instead? Who would do that? Certainly not God our Father, Jesus says. Friends, prayer is so personal, is so important, is so meaningful, but at its core, it's not just about asking for help. We're trying to control what's happening around us. At its core, prayer is a deep conversation with a loving Father who knows us better than we know ourselves and who is willing to share everything with us, even His Spirit. And we won't always know why certain things happen, why we face pain, loss, or unanswered prayers. But Jesus assures us of one thing. God is good. He does not hand out scorpions when we ask for eggs. He does not give us stones when we need bread. 
Even when life feels hard and our prayers seem to go unanswered, we can, Jesus says, trust in God's goodness. So why pray? Why pray? Because it brings us closer to the heart of God. And it brings us into God's presence where we can be comforted and shaped, where we can learn and be reassured that God our Father is always working for our good, even in the waiting and even in the struggle. So hope while we keep asking and seeking and knocking, trusting that at the heart of God, there are eggs, not scorpions. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you feeling overwhelmed at times, unsure of how or why to pray. With so many questions and burdens on our hearts, you still invite us to ask, seek, and knock. We confess that in our struggles, we sometimes question your goodness or mistake your silence for absence. Help us to trust you as a good father, even when we don't understand, when we're still waiting, or when life doesn't go as we had hoped. Remind us that you don't give us stones when we need bread or scorpions when we need eggs. In those moments when we feel like we are knocking on a door that just won't open, give us the strength to persist, trusting that you are with us in the waiting. Shape us through these prayers, Lord. Draw us closer to you so that in every moment, whether joyful or painful, we may come to trust your goodness more deeply. Thank you for being with us, for hearing us, and for loving us unconditionally. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.